Hello, you're listening to Kopi Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Tim Rubek, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 47th episode. Today, we will talk about perhaps the most complex and critically important product in the modern world, semiconductors. They are in everything we use, and they're also at the heart of the great power tech rivalry. To delve into this fascinating subject, we're lucky to have with us Dan Wang. Dan writes on China's technology progress and the effects of U.S. regulatory actions. In particular, he tracks China's semiconductor capabilities, U.S. measures on export controls, the pace of supply chain relocation, and broader tech industrial policy. Dan has given keynotes for a variety of organizations, and his work is widely cited in the press. He's a contributor to Bloomberg Opinion. Dan Wang, welcome to Kopi Time. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hey, it's great to have you. Uh, I would like you to help our listeners to just lay out the basic facts on the world of semiconductors and all that's going on. So if you could just give us a sense of, you know, who are the leading companies and countries uh, in the area of both development and production of semiconductors? A very big question indeed. So semiconductors are uh, one of the most complex, if not the single most complex technology industry uh, in the world. And you have basically quite a few uh, companies and quite a few countries basically involved in every aspect of production. So if I'm thinking through basically the way that, um, you know, silicon is rendered into wafers and then transformed into uh, particular dyes uh, and then gets turned into integrated circuits. Circuits, you know, roughly the way that I think about it is this. So, you know, just let me list a few countries uh, one by one. So, um, Korea is uh, maybe the most straightforward. Um, so, the Korean firms, namely Samsung and SK Hynix, are really good at making memory chips. Uh, Taiwan is fairly straightforward as well. It has a major company, TSMC, that actually manufactures um, a lot of the semiconductors, uh, and then it also has a a few more design firms. Um, the uh, Europeans uh, have mostly lost a lot of their semiconductor capabilities, but they are still strong in two broad areas. The first is production of semiconductor manufacturing equipment, namely ASML in Holland. Um, and then uh, basically it is still very good at making quite a few types of industrial chips, um, namely things like auto chips. That makes uh, pretty good sense given uh, that Europe is still very much uh, an auto heavy producing country, uh, a, a very auto heavy producing continent. Um, and there are still certain European firms involved in parts of the uh, chemicals and gases that are really important for um, semiconductors. Now, maybe the two most interesting countries are, uh, first of all, uh, the US, and then second of all, China. So the U.S. more or less invented the integrated circuit um, it, back in the um, 60s with a lot of um, procurement from uh, the Department of Defense. Today, it is uh, you know, a little bit less dominant uh, in a lot of different types of semiconductor technologies, but it is still... I would say the most important player in so many different aspects. So, you know, there are so many um, different uh, semiconductor design firms in California where I used to work. These are names like NVIDIA and Broadcom and Qualcomm and Apple is now a very important chip design firm. Um, these include uh, things like uh, companies like Intel and Micron who are still some of the world's manufacturing leaders today, even though both Intel as well as Micron have seen a, a little bit of better days. Uh, and maybe the most important part of of the US supply chain is its dominance of the equipment and technologies to actually manufacture and design semiconductors. So in order to design an integrated circuit, you need um, something called EDA tools, um, which is a part of the software to uh, really try to design these integrated circuits. And this is almost entirely an American affair dominated by firms like Cadence, Synopsys, and Mentor. And then in addition, you need, after you have um, the designs in place, you need to actually manufacture the semiconductors. And um, this is where the Americans are still very dominant. You have firms like Lam Research, Kelly Tankor, and Applied Materials that are very big players. And uh, where does China fit in? Well, China is starting to get fairly good at designing chips. Uh, Huawei is a very competent outfit, at least at designing and chips for its own smartphones. Um, and uh, China is beginning to have a little bit of a position on memory. It is beginning to have basically, you know, um, 
coming up to a lead, uh, coming up to catching up to the technological frontier, um, the actual manufacturing of semiconductors, but it's still very far behind in terms of the software as well as the equipment to actually manufacture chips. And so, you know, the interesting story over the next decade will be to see exactly how quickly China can actually catch up to the U.S. in pretty much every segment that the U.S. is good at because China is very keen to have technologies that the U.S. is almost the sole provider and it is, uh, you know, not necessarily having an easy time buying things in these political conditions. Is uh, Japan part of this picture at all? Uh, Japan is a very uh, big part of this picture, and I'm, I'm sorry to have neglected it. Um, Japan used to be uh, a very big producer of semiconductors, but actually a lot of the semiconductor companies have mostly faded away. And uh, where Japan is still very important is um, part of the capital equipment process. So like Europe, it is producing quite a lot of the uh, chemicals and gases, as well as a lot of the actual silicon wafers to actually manufacture semiconductors. And it is pretty important still for semiconductor manufacturing equipment. So Tokyo Electron is one of the big companies out there manufacturing a very critical part of the semiconductor production equipment process. And you, you've mentioned the phrase faded several times, both in the context of the US and now you just mentioned in the context of Japan. And even in the case of US, uh, Europe, you said that you know it used to be a big powerhouse and has sort of seeded some of its uh, prowess. So explain the dynamics of uh, integrated circuit manufacturing over the last 30, 40 years. Why did it sort of shift away from certain places and migrate to some other places? That's absolutely uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of this industry in which you see particular firms uh, rise up and then um, you know fade away. You see basically industrial leadership pass between various countries in a way that is not very typical, for example, of the computer industry or the software industry, which are very much uh, dominated by the U.S., ever since uh, the earliest days. Uh, and so semiconductors looks a little bit more like machine tools in which um, you know, US and UK had the earliest leadership, moved on to uh, Japan and uh, Germany, and now I think sort of moving on to China. And so you know, it's, um, there are absolutely a lot of fascinating stories here, but they may be a little bit m- m- more of micro stories. So Intel uh, in the 80s was really a firm manufacturing DRAM memory chips. And it uh, was uh, basically mostly had its uh, butt kicked by the Japanese who were able to make much better um, DRAM chips than uh, even Intel was. The uh, the Koreans then, um, through the 80s, uh, managed to catch up to Japan with some American sorry, help. Yeah, I'm gonna, and, sorry, I apologize. I'm going to interrupt please. you for a second. When you say that they were much better, the Japanese chips, because they were cheaper or better quality? Uh, better quality, especially. So the American chips were um, sort of... Um, diffuse, uh, they were not so heavily capitally concentrated, um, where yes, the Japanese firms sort of figured out the technology and then had much better quality of manufacturing than the Americans and were much bigger in scale than um, the uh, American players. Now, um, sort of the uh, same story played out with um, South Korea relative to Japan. Um, South Korea now is uh, very much dominant in memory chips. Uh, And then Taiwan entered the picture by getting very good at being a foundry only. So it did not design substantial amounts of its own chips. It was simply a manufacturer. And that's sort of a a bit of the Taiwanese story uh, in a nutshell in so many other ways. Taiwanese firms are very good at producing things that are not branded by their own firms, producing goods that are for, for example, American companies like um, Apple, and so, you know, you see basically industrial leadership pass between different countries, pass between different companies, sometimes going in the same direction, sometimes going in the opposite direction. And now China is very intent on challenging uh, everything that basically the Koreans, Japanese, uh, Taiwanese, Americans and Europeans are good at. Okay, I definitely want to get into the Chinese story momentarily, but I'm fascinated by TSMC and I've heard you in other forums talk about the journey of TSMC. Uh, How on earth did a single company in this highly lucrative competitive field become such a big dominant player? And, And also give our listeners a flavor of how dominant are they right now? 
Right. So TSMC, if you just take a look at market share, um, I believe manufactures around 50% of all semiconductors um, uh, in the world. And I think that still understates how important it is because these are some of the most advanced chips uh, out there. So a major firm like NVIDIA, which has become so important as part of this uh, artificial intelligence story for a very long time, only gave orders to TSMC um, and you know not really favoring its competitors, TSMC's competitors. Uh, with uh, firms like uh, UMC, for example. And so TSMC uh, was uh, had a bit of a head start early on over uh, a couple of its competitors uh, like UMC, like SMIC uh, in, in China. And then it's really been able to compound that difference. And so, um, you know, every uh, semiconductor success story looks alike. Uh, you know, you have these companies that make monopoly margins they're able to invest uh, for future rounds of R&D when everyone else catches up, uh, then they drop those um, uh, monopoly margins onto commodity margins. Whereas uh, every semiconductor failure is kind of a failure in, in its own special way. But uh, there are a couple of uh, companies that have really enjoyed this virtuous cycle of really being on the technological frontier, earning monopoly margins um, in the first few years, uh, and then using those monopoly margins to find future rounds of R&D. D. So these examples include Samsung, which is very specialized in memory, uh, Intel, which does its own um, things, mostly involved in microprocessors for PCs, as well as data centers, uh, and then TSMC, um, especially. And TSMC, I think, has been the biggest beneficiary of this um, you know, fabulous foundry model in which you have a lot of firms, especially in California, just focused on the design, not doing committing any of their own capital to doing manufacturing, and then TSMC focuses exclusively on manufacturing. And this is something that uh, has really compounded and worked uh, out very well, in addition to just being a fantastically run company uh, in, in, in Taiwan. I want to ask you a couple of things about that issue related to manufacturing. How complex is manufacturing these latest generation of chips and how expensive are they? Well, maybe the best way to illustrate that is to, uh, by reference to an ASML machine. So ASML is the Dutch based company that is making um, sort of the sole provider now of uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography, EUV uh, lithography equipment, which you need to uh, make the cutting edge chips, which today are around three to five nanometers. And so, um, you know, if you take a look at a particular ASML machine, each of them is uh, about the size of a bus. Uh, took about 30 years really of um, deep ex uh, experimentation as well as doing quite a bit of science to be able to create just a single one of these machines. Um, they, you need about three um, airliners to transport one of these things and they cost around $150 million to $200 million each. And you know, just appreciating that particular machine as one, the most complex, but still uh, one of a very complex value chain of different technologies required to produce semiconductors. It's really tough to you know, wrap one's mind around um, each of these things. You need gases and chemicals that are extraordinarily pure. Um, you need silicon wafers that have um, no bits of corruption inside. You need very skilled engineers uh, who have been working um, extensively with these things to you know, think through the light physics and chemistry really to be able to produce a chip Everything here is, uh, you know, makes up a lot of the most complex proce uh, processes that we know in the technological world. And how much money are we talking about for the latest foundry that TSMC has built? Well, uh, TSMC announced, uh, gosh, I need to check my figures here, but it's something like 40 billion dollars, I believe, um, in terms of capital um, allocation uh, over the next uh, year. I, I think that's, um, that's about right. And, you know, for, uh, you know, but even before this massive, uh, you know, announcement of uh, capital, um, for uh, each of the last few years, the three leaders, namely Intel, Samsung, and TSMC, have been investing north of $15 billion each um, for you know, each of the last uh, few years. So this is an extremely capital-intensive uh, industry. A new um, uh, TSMC fab, uh, I believe the three nanometer fab in Tainan, will cost something north of $20 billion for one particular factory. And I'm pretty sure these are the most expensive operations on Earth. Wow. 
Uh, okay, so Dan, I'm blown away by the you know dollar figures, but I'm also kind of intrigued by one thing you mentioned briefly about the smart engineers you need who are at the cutting edge of solid state physics and chemical engineering and electrical engineering. So it's not just that you need a lot of money, you need some really smart and capable engineers too. You need smart and capable engineers who have a uh, very uh, good experience actually working with these semiconductors. Otherwise you have no hope of catching up to the leading edge. Now, you know, a semiconductor in theory is a very simple concept. You know, uh, I can draw a perfect transistor for you, uh, basically something that turns on and off. That does not mean I can produce something uh, commercially. That does not mean I can, you know, produce something at any sort of reasonable cost. Um, that anyone wants to use. And so, you know, the semiconductor physics, I think, are pretty straightforward. Um, but what, you know, uh, uh, challengers like uh, China really lack are, um, you know, the very deep pools of knowledge um, that have worked very extensively with this technology, that have deep production experience, that know, you know, what goes wrong, how much chemicals to use, what sort of lighting conditions are best, that just have a lot of this tacit knowledge, what I think of as process knowledge, um, this deep experience with uh, working through all of these things uh, in basically a very intense and uh, long-term way. Hmm. Now, earlier you mentioned that even in the 80s, Intel uh, faced tremendous competition from Japanese manufacturers. And also in the last decade, anybody who looks at Intel's share price can tell that they've had a bit of a rough time in keeping up with their uh, manufacturing prowess, even with this generation of uh, chips. So, um, the U.S. is full of bright minds, as we have seen in the case of Silicon Valley. I'm sure there's, you know, hundreds if not thousands of you know, smart engineers coming out every day, uh, year. I mean, why can Intel hire them and put in a lot of money and keep pace with TSMC? Well, this is uh, comes back uh, a bit to the experience question, and I think it is also worth thinking through, you know, what Silicon Valley is today and what it is not. Now, I used to live uh, in uh, San Francisco. I worked in Silicon Valley, but I worked in consumer internet companies, what we think of as the uh, sexy elements of tech. And I, in a normal year, I am in the Bay Area around uh, once every quarter to spend, um, you know, some time chatting with different technology folks. One of the things I'm astonished by is how bifurcated uh, Silicon Valley has become. Really, the consumer internet people who are driving so many of the interesting headlines at companies like Google and Facebook really have no conception or understanding or interest in the semiconductor companies uh, like Intel or Broadcom or Applied Materials. They are really you know, not even talking to each other. And so I think it is still the case that, you know, if you are a smart Stanford grad, if you're a, an Ivy League grad, there is still much more appeal in working at big banks like, I dare say, DBS uh, than at a less sexy company like uh, applied Materials, whom I bet uh, one's mother has probably not heard of. And so, you know, if you have, a, I, I think, uh, you know, a timer, you might agree with me here, we don't need that many more smart minds and asset allocation. Maybe we should be doing much more science and technology instead. It's, uh, you know, it's just a stark, harsh reality. You're right. But of course, you know, uh, those who have been on the consumer end of the computer also have done very well in the last 20, 30 years, uh, the, the, the ones who work for Google and so on. So I'd like to think that, especially out of business school, I think in the recent years, we have seen more people going in the tech world, but perhaps the bifurcation you're talking about is a fascinatingly disturbing insight, which is the innards of the internet and the computer world, everything that sort of runs the world is still not being serviced adequately by the fine minds, whereas everybody is the shinier part of the uh, the, the tech world. Um, so Dan, you have sort of given us a sense of why a company like TSMC, which has deep experience as well as you know deep pool of capital can be at the uh, frontier of cheap manufacturing. I just wanna, want you to give us a sense of you know, what that frontier means. Uh, is it the case that Moore's law has been exhausted and we're not really doubling processor speed anymore? And is it also the case that do we need to double the speed of processor every 18 months? Uh, 
The question on Moore's law is um, still a little bit controversial. Um, there are a lot of um, skeptics now of Moore's law, but there are also a lot of defenders who uh, of Moore's law who point out correctly that Moore's law has died a, a thousand times uh, mm. in the newspapers and in analyst reports. And so far, it still looks like it is uh, going. Um, but I think the bulk of the evidence is um, you know, uh, on the side of the skeptics who are not so sure that Moore's law has has uh, many uh, years uh, left to go. And you know, the way that I think about this is that um, you're right, first of all, that um, you know, maybe we don't need um, so many uh, advanced uh, chips for the most cutting edge processes. So you know, if you take a look at uh, what are the most, what constitute the most advanced chips uh, today, a lot of it is made up uh, of uh, smartphone processors, um, especially iPhone processors. And smartphones have really driven basically a lot of the investment in semiconductors over the last decade, uh, really since um, Apple's iPhone in 2008. And uh, so many um, smartphones now, I think, um, you know, we know that smartphones are, uh, have been a declining industry. Um, for the last four years, smartphone sales, shipment sales have actually continuously declined. And it's not very clear that for even these new AI chips, these server chips, as far as I can tell, a lot of these are manufactured at 14 nanometers or uh, 12 nanometers. They're not necessarily using three nanometer processes for Amazon's new server chips. And so Moore's Law is also a reflection of different um, economic processes. So if basically each of these fabs uh, costs a lot more money, say on the scale of $20 billion each, and there's a little bit less, uh, you know, a fewer use cases, at least as far as we can tell at the moment, you know, I'm not really sure that this will have uh, a great deal of room to run. And that's especially the case if you buy into uh, different, uh, the hype around 5G. So now I don't really buy the hype around 5G. 5G, but if you do, and you think that there's going to be uh, a semiconductor in my pen, there's going to be a semiconductor in my lamp, well, you know, you don't really necessarily need the most cutting edge chips um, in a traffic light. And so a lot of these trailing edge technologies will be good enough for a lot of the things that we want to do going forward. Okay. And again, I'm just so captivated by the $20, $30 billion numbers because they're just so large. It's hard to get my mind around it. How long does it take for TSMC to make profit out of that huge investment? Right. Um, this is going to take, uh, you know, I think it takes them... <sighs> a couple of years, um, well, first of all, to have the uh, facility up and running. I believe the usual figure is around, um, you know, at least three years uh, from Greenfield investment to actually get this going. Uh, and then, you know, so, but, um, you know, the good news for uh, so many of these companies is that, you know, the, you know, the World Semiconductor um, Trade Council has done these very exquisite forecasts. You know, there's a lot of forecasts about how much consumer demand there will be uh, for different, um, you know, uh, smartphones, for example. And so I believe that they are able uh, more or less to figure out a, um, you know, the capital commitment that meets, uh, for example, Apple's forecasts, and then they have some way to, you know, smooth out the uncertainty and then smooth out the costs uh, so that the time doesn't take far too long. Okay, but we still have, I mean, I think the phrase that you used earlier was, you know, fabulous foundries that, you know, many American companies in particular would rather be on the design side than the manufacturing side. And I was wondering whether the fact that, you know, it takes a while and forecasts are forecast at the end of the day, there is some uncertainty and you're parking billions of dollars in place. So maybe you are better off just outsourcing it to Foxconn or, or rather TSMC or somebody else to make it as opposed to making it with your getting your hands dirty. Uh, that's uh, sort of the uh, very quintessential um, American attitude that you've uh -huh. uh, articulated there, Timor, that, yeah. you know, why should they get their hands dirty? Why should they, you know, engage in this incredible capital expenditure when, you know, those people in Asia can just do that work? Uh, this is off your own balance sheet. They prove themselves pretty good at it. And basically, at this point, you know, the uh, eight companies in Asia are getting a pretty good deal out of it themselves as well, mostly because, uh, you know, TSMC is just so dominant. Um, it is uh, no longer really has uh, much competition at all on the high end. And so it took a while for this model really to work out. Uh, but at this point, it can be a very profitable company indeed. Right. But at the same time, we read about Apple wanting to build their own chips. 
So is the trend at least, if not getting reversed, but somewhat getting challenged in certain sectors? Uh, I'm not sure that I'm aware of that news. We know that Apple is very extensively many. Uh, it's very extensively designing its chips. Um, the iPhone processors are certainly Apple's, and Apple is now through the M1 chip increasingly designing uh, more chips for uh, laptops and um, for PCs. But I think, for um, as, as far as I can tell, it is still going to be relying on. Um, TSMC to manufacture. It doesn't need to get its hands so dirty as to engage in the direct manufacturing itself. Okay, so that A14 chip and the Bionic, these are designed by Apple, but not manufactured by Apple. Correct. Just like a Qualcomm and NVIDIA chip is, are designed by these firms and manufactured by TSMC. Yeah, like my phone says, designed in um, Silicon Valley. Oh no, it says Sunnyvale or something, but it's of course <laughs> uh, made entirely in Asia. Uh, okay, we have not talked about China in a, in depth, and you're talking to us from Shanghai, and I'm very curious to hear uh, your take on sort of China's journey in, in this area and where they are and where they're going. Sure. Well, um, so China is now pretty good at designing chips. Um, so I mentioned Huawei earlier, designing uh, pretty sophisticated chips for its own smartphones. And we also see a couple of other success, success areas. Um, there are certain AI chips now that China is taking a crack at. There are certain server chips that um, Huawei has taken a crack at. And we know that um, you know this is a, sort of a trivial application, um, but uh, crypto chips is something that a lot of Chinese firms were really good at, although you know it's trivial, but now um, maybe also quite lucrative uh, to be in this um, uh, in a tidy little business. Um, China lacks uh, manufacturing capabilities, so China's manufacturing leader is SMIC, SMIC, which is roughly um, at least five years behind TSMC in terms of capabilities. But you know, five years behind TSMC is not exactly catastrophic. That's basically where the iPhone six um, still an amazing. Um, sales uh, the, the product for Apple a few years ago. Um, you know that's not, I would say, a, a horrible position for China to be in. And China is now ramping up its production of memory chips, so it is now a bit more sophisticated on NAND chips. Um, Bit behind in DRAM, which is um, far more valuable. Um, and this is where the Korean companies really have a lock on the market. But you know, most industry observers uh, basically think that China is going to be a fairly important player in memory in the next few years, just in the same way that Japan and Korea both figured out semiconductors after figuring out memory. Where China is really behind are the capital equipment to actually produce the chips uh, as well as the uh, software to design the chips. This is, uh, again, mostly an American affair with some Japanese and Dutch participation here. And this is where you know China really needs to figure out this very science-based process to uh, manufacture uh, these machines that actually produce the chips. And, and do you see evidence of progress? I mean, are they, you know, writing papers in scientific journals showing that, you know, there's domestic grown know-how and are the Chinese engineers having been involved in not the cutting edge, but at least somewhat close to cutting edge manufacturing for a decade are now getting better at these things? There are certainly green shoots. So there are Chinese companies um, that are uh, have some part of the domestic market for um, semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Um, as best as I can tell, around 10% of the um, production equipment sold in China are made by Chinese headquartered firms. Um, but these are mostly, um, you know, very lagging edge um, technology. These do not come anything close to what Japan or Holland uh, or the U.S. is able to make. Um, a lot of these are subsidy driven. So when I speak with Chinese semiconductor firms, they would tell me, yeah, sure, you know, the government bought one of these for us, uh, but we don't even really want to turn these on and learn how to use um, these things because they are just uh, so far behind. Um, but the real question for me is not how far behind is China today, but how quickly can it catch up because it is making very intensive efforts to you know, catch up to the technological frontier on this very critical technology. Did uh, Donald Trump's trade war set things back for China in a meaningful manner? <laughs> 
Absolutely. So um, President Trump has uh, signed executive orders or targeted for sanctions um, pretty much all of China's leading technology firms. If you ask me what are the most important technology companies in China, I would say these are names like Huawei, first of all, and then also Alibaba, Tencent, SMIC, and by dance. And, um, you know, pretty much all of these companies have faced some form of U.S. sanctions, uh, except for Alibaba. Uh, in this case, it is the Chinese government that's doing the punishment. Um, but, you know, all of these other firms uh, have faced some form of um, U.S. sanctions. The impact for Tencent and ByteDance is not very severe. Basically, it's a minor product offering of theirs that's being tied up in the U.S. And these orders have been halted by federal courts. The impact might be quite a bit more severe on SMIC, although it's still a little bit too early to tell what that sanctions order means. When it comes to Huawei, the impact is pretty clear. Uh, Huawei's major business lines are smartphones, um, which made up around 55% of revenue um, in 2019, base stations, which made up 35%, uh, and then enterprise, which are things like cloud and surveillance systems, uh, which made up 10%. And we know now that Huawei's smartphone sales are very deeply being squeezed. Um, I think the forecast I saw for this year is that uh, Huawei will only be able to ship around a third to a half of the smartphones it sold uh, in 2020, which was already fairly low. Um, its base stations, uh, I think, uh, cannot be manufactured in much more quantity um, by, by the end of 2021. And um, its enterprise uh, segment is doing okay, um, but it's its smallest revenue segment. So Huawei is now in very deep trouble. Uh, and uh, China's most advanced semiconductor maker is in very deep trouble. And then uh, the U.S. government has also issued light sanctions on uh, a company like Xiaomi as well. And so, you know, a lot of these giants are really getting caught up. Now, you know, the interesting part is, you know, again, uh, what happens in the next few years. I think that President Trump has really delivered a lot of setbacks to these Chinese companies in the short term. But I think in the longer term, this really drives a determination in China to master a lot of these different technologies. Yeah, that's one narrative that I heard a lot in 2019, that in a way, the, the tr tech war uh, was like a Pearl Harbor moment for China, that you know they would not suffer these indignities and they would double up on, uh, on 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 uh, building more homegrown capabilities. Um, Dan, earlier when you were talking about Chinese firms getting subsidies from the government, I was sort of wondering about the U.S. firms getting subsidies from the U.S. government. I mean, can you envision a scenario where national security concerns sort of nudge the Pentagon towards subsidizing manufacturing of fabs in the U.S.? Uh, I can not only imagine it, Tamar, I can uh, see it uh, basically right now. So uh, last year, Congress passed the CHIPS Act, CHIPS Act, as part of the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which promises um, very large subsidies uh, for manufacturers, semiconductor manufacturers to be based in the U.S. And uh, I had to take a look again at uh, basically exactly what is the structure of these subsidies. The last I saw, you know, there was something like, you know, up to $3 billion um, that the uh, Congress would authorize the Department of Commerce to um, give to any semiconductor manufacturer that will develop uh, in the U.S. And so now we have stories like um, TSMC building a new fab in Arizona, where there are already quite a lot of substantial, pretty substantial semiconductor capabilities. We also see a company like uh, Samsung, which uh, has promised to invest more in, I think, Austin um, to produce more. In addition, um, TSMC, I'm sorry, Intel and Micron are still very, very important semiconductor manufacturers. So I think the uh, U.S. capabilities here, at least on manufacturing, have seen better days, but I think there will be enough uh, capacity uh, in the country that uh, will, I think, train up a lot of talent to make the U.S manufacturing sector great again, at least with respect to chips. Right. I just saw this morning that the UK is liberalizing its visa requirement for um, foreigners with tech background. I can easily see under Biden administration in the next few years, you know, again, like a tech visa type thing where, you know, if you have advanced degrees from a great school in the US, you get an automatic green card 
and work in one of these companies, uh, which I think, you know, uh, is a win-win for both that student and for the U.S. So I'm pretty sure something like that would happen. Um, but uh, Dan, the question again goes back to the setbacks that we have seen with the intels of the world. And I think you just touched on the uncertainty as well that just giving subsidy or just um, throwing lots of money at it may not be sufficient because we are, I mean, it's not just making a widget. It is a lot of, as you said, computer science and chemical engineering and solid state physics, all of those combined. Um, so, but you think that the US can sort of trace back its leadership in, in a matter of years or it's not a done deal? I think there is a pretty good chance that the US can reclaim leadership. Uh, and so if I take a look at the customers of semiconductors, uh, these are still, you know, the US is still a major tech leader, um, even if it's in uh, consumer internet, which I enjoy a little bit less. But, you know, you have firms like Amazon and Microsoft being major purchasers of, um, you know, servers for their cloud uh, businesses. You have, um, you know, companies like uh, Facebook and Google are doing a lot of um, intel uh, artificial intelligence um, in terms of uh, PyTorch uh, as well as TensorFlow, um, doing uh, quite a lot of having very sophisticated uh, chips needs. And then most of all, you have uh, Apple, which is a very good and big customer for various different types of chips. So, you know, a lot of these um, chips will be embedded in servers um, that will go up to, let's say, Washington State or Oregon. They don't don't need to be, you know, uh, there's a, already a very large pool of customers. In addition, when you combine that with the fact that the U.S. is still a leader in a lot of semiconductor manufacturing technologies, um, in, in terms of uh, being able to produce that capital equipment, I don't think that it is too much of a stretch to imagine that as the U.S. gets much more intent on cultivating its uh, semiconductor uh, base again, you know, it will become very good. You know, I think what would be more challenging is if you ask the U.S us to become really good at something like consumer electronics, which is mostly located today in Shenzhen. That's a tougher ask. Um, but given that there are so many U.S. firms which are already customers and have competences in this technology, I don't think it's too tough to imagine. Right. And I think, again, the national security concerns, I guess, are far more paramount than wanting to build a TV at home versus it being built in China or Vietnam. Um, yeah, and in the course of the last few years, we heard about this risk of this bifurcation of the global supply chain, one sort of centered around China, one centered outside of China. At the chip level, if you indeed see, you know, TSMC sort of, you know, gravitating towards the U.S. orbit and making the cutting edge chips for U.S. companies and also some of the chips being made in the U.S., and China sort of gets left behind. Um, and, and, you know, you're talking about four or five years at least before they catch up, maybe even longer. Then aren't we seeing seeds of some serious geopolitical tension where China is sort of left out of the really good stuff and the rest of the world is sort of not buying some of the things that are made in China? Well, I would say that we are uh, a bit past the seeds of geopolitical tension. We uh, these seeds have already sprouted uh, in the last few years um, under, you know, uh, President Trump as well as a uh, more hawkish uh, Beijing as well. So, um, you know, I think it is um, an important thing to consider um, whether China will get left behind. And Timur, you offered earlier the uh, historical comparison of Pearl Harbor. Uh, I think the more apt comparison is something like uh, Sputnik. So, um, you know, the U.S. has uh, mostly triggered a Sputnik moment in China by continuously kneecapping leading Chinese firms like Huawei. And instead of really realizing its own Sputnik moment, um, the U.S. has triggered one in China, uh, which it sort of laid bare to both the Chinese people as well as, uh, more importantly, the Chinese leadership, that for all of China's vaunted technology triumphs um, in things like mobile payments or high-speed rail, these are really not sufficient um, in the most uh, important technology, uh, semiconductors, which is underpins so many of the other digital successes. And so, you know, I think China is going to become very, very intent on trying to figure out these different technologies. You know, there are so many data points that I can point to, but, you know, to give one example of how much the Chinese leadership is thinking about um, technology now, you know, at the end of the year, um, the 
uh, uh, the state holds uh, something called the Central Economic Work Conference, uh, in which it sets basically the eight major economic pieces of work that the government will undertake uh, over the next year. And the very top priority in 2020 was for China to do science and technology as the very top of the uh, eight items. And as far as I can tell, China has never broken out science and technology independently in any of the Central Economic Work Conference reports. To see it being broken out as the very top item, you know, is very, very surprising to me. And it just shows how China is now in very much of a whole of society effort to you know, have the government uh, provide leadership as well as coordinating services to its uh, leading firms like Huawei, which are deeply suffering now. Uh, and then they are very, very intent to figure these things out. And China's endowment, I would say, is not terribly poor. There is uh, still a huge market here. There is a lot of growth. The Chinese uh, technology companies are, you know, quite a bit behind American companies, I would say. But, you know, they are uh, sort of, uh, I would say, broadly still ahead, um, you know, in some ways than Europe and uh, Japan uh, and uh, everyone else. And so, uh, and there's also quite a lot of um, science training in China. Probably the quality is not the same level as Caltech or Stanford or MIT, um, but you know there's just uh, you know what China lacks in quality, quality it can probably partially make up in quantity. There are just so many grads of science programs here, and so you know add up all of these things together. I think uh, you know you can't count the U.S. out, you can't count China out. Both of these will be um, racing ahead, and I think it will be a fairly close race. Dan, I'll, I'll share with you an anecdote. A friend of mine who has taught both at Harvard and at Tsinghua says that in terms of intellectual capability, the students are identical, but in terms of ambition, the, the Tsinghua students are at a whole different level than the American students who basically want to get wow. an Ivy League tenure tech job, whereas these guys want to take over departments and create their own universities. So, uh, so yeah, when you when you talk about quantity and drive, I, I certainly think that you know there is a lot of uh, tailwind in, in, in China in, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I sort of you know take your point about the Sputnik moment versus the Pearl Harbor moment. I brought up Pearl Harbor simply because I felt that the attack was so pronounced from the U.S. in the last sure. four years that uh, even though the Chinese, I guess, had a sense of dread given Trump's pre-election rhetoric did not expect it to be that uh, hard and that uh, sort of furious. Whereas I felt that the 2025 plan that they announced even before Trump came in was in a way sort of a galvanizing Sputnik processes for them. But I, I fully take your point that this sort of, sort of social call right now to sort of you know line up all the resources to get tech self-sufficiency is certainly you know, very, very visible in China. Um, Dan, uh, you... Uh, have been extremely helpful in shedding light on this. I want to talk to you about something very current, uh, and um, it, it may not be that relevant for your day-to-day -day work, but you know, for us and for the rest of the world, this ongoing chip shortages, or and, and as a result, it's sort of spilling over the parts shortages in auto industry and in electronics industry and so on. Has that spilled over to China? I mean, when you are sort of talking to your counterparts in Shanghai, do you hear ripple effects of that? And do you have any light to shed as to what's going on? Sure. Well, I think the um, it was the China that experienced this phenomenon first. Um, I remember picking up news reports in November when the um, Chinese auto manufacturers um, started saying, "Well, we're lacking semiconductors," and uh, you know, at the time, this was not broadly reported, uh, and uh, many people uh, wasn't really aware that such a thing uh, was going on. And in fact, a lot of the Chinese media stated that, "Oh my goodness, this is yet another conspiracy orchestrated by the United States." Uh, meant to hurt uh, Chinese companies. But then, you know, the um, situation ended up uh, being like something uh, like COVID in which um, China was uh, the first country really struck uh, and then sort of was a much bigger problem uh, everywhere else. Now we see major European and American auto manufacturers, uh, you know, complaining about this. And I think, you know, the Chinese uh, commentary is uh, not quite right here. There is nothing nefarious um, about these, uh, this 
problem. This was simply a mismatch of uh, supply and demand in which um, auto parts uh, were always sort of at the lower, um, at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of allocation for uh, manufacturing. Now, a lot of these uh, parts companies simply aren't paying, uh, you know, Apple levels uh, in order to get their chips. Um, the I believe the auto industry, which I don't really cover, um, had uh, forecasted, under forecasted how robust um, auto demand would be uh, on the from consumers. And then in addition, we had, uh, you know, a couple of idiosyncratic things, mostly related to China, in which uh, Huawei locked up a lot of allocation for uh, the actual manufacturers because it could uh, imminently no longer get chips uh, past September of 2020. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, SMIC was also uh, designated to the entity list, which has put a little bit of a crimp in its ability to keep expanding. Uh, as best as I can tell, this auto chip shortage will uh, last for a few more months, uh, possibly through the end of the year. Um, but this is um, this to me is more of a um, anomalous cyclical mismatch rather than uh, anything very structurally deeper with the industry, even though it is really concentrating a lot of minds now, uh, especially on you know reason number 5,000 that uh, semiconductors are really important. Right, indeed. Uh, no, I, I, I hope and I think I concur that, you know, it's probably largely idiosyncratic factors. Six months time, we probably would not be talking about it as much. Uh, finally, Dan, uh, coming back to that sort of civilizational conflict between the U.S. and China, we have Joe Biden as president. Temperatures are going to be a little lower, hopefully. Do you see some space for constructive engagement in the area of tech or it's just way too sensitive and the two countries, militaries are involved, and, and that is one area where Biden really can't climb down. Very difficult to tell. Um, so we know uh, from President Biden's uh, first actions, it's uh, about exactly a month uh, since he uh, first uh, entered the White House, that he has not been very deeply conciliatory against China. Um, his comments, um, his focuses have been pretty hawkish still. In addition, in addition, he has not relaxed very many constraints. But I think it can still be a little bit too early to tell about what exactly he wants to do. You know, the more benign view here is that, uh, first of all, um, it's um, simply a matter of domestic politics that he cannot let go of um, these issues on China too quickly. Uh, and then also he uh, won't have too many of his assistant secretaries uh, installed in departments like commerce or treasury or defense, at least for a few more months. Um, probably these positions still won't be filled uh, until at least through the summer. And so, you know, I think there is um, some hope at least that uh, Biden can walk back a few of these um, different areas, mostly uh, due to business lobbying. Now, um, I'm here in uh, Shanghai. Uh, there are so many companies, uh, American companies in China, uh, who would uh, say that, you know, um, China was responsible for pretty much um, you know, 90 to almost the entire profit of the group. Um, without China, there wouldn't have been any profits uh, in the group company uh, this year. There is a lot to lose if you are a semiconductor company, um, if you can't access China. Financials especially are also very keen to access China. And so I expect that the Biden administration will be somewhat responsive to these concerns, uh, but it is, uh, you know, too soon to tell um, how much that, uh, how, how responsive exactly they will be. As you said, uh, you know, the uh, I think you put it very aptly that things will cool down relative to uh, Trump, but maybe if cools down and everything sort of crystallizes and not too much gets walked back, that is also a potential scenario to me. Yeah, that's a sober reality. Uh, Dan, uh, I can't tell you how thankful I am for your brilliant insights. I think our listeners are going to benefit tremendously from hearing your views on this incredibly important topic. So again, thank you very much. Well, Timer, thank you again for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Thanks to our listeners, too. What a fascinating subject. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Taki. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 47 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.